And welcome to the MPG Podcast. I am John Grabiel, joined with... Jordan Missig. Hello, Jordan. Hello. Can you guess where I am this time? (laughs) You are at the MPG Garage in Joliet, Illinois, correct? Pretty familiar background. Can you tell from uh, last season and the season before? Yeah. Yes, Um, I I love the background. (laughs) It's always a nice background for sure. Um, It means I'm in a good spot. That's all for sure. Um, So I like this. But uh, you have a little bit of a plane propeller in your background. So I'm guessing you are uh, just moving into your finishing moving up into your new house and everything um yeah that's my uh that's gonna go up in the in the office we're just putting um some doors in the office so there's a little bit of uh work i uh, we had an open area that we closed off to turn into an office we already have the uh simulator in there and boy i i i, <laughs> I should have got this simulator i haven't spent that much time on it but the time that i have spent on it uh, we should have gotten this kind of simulator before. It is a super, <laughs> super, super nice simulator. Well, I mean, you know, when you look at it and you talk about simulators, um, you don't want to just normally dive headfirst into the deep end um, because you have no idea what to expect. Um, you know, it's the same thing when buying cars. You know, you don't just go out there and buy, like, the fastest car that's out there. You kind of work up to it. So kind of the same yeah. with simulators where you kind of, you, got, you guys, uh, luckily enough, build your own you build your own simulator um, with PVC pipe um, a couple of years ago. That was ago our first and, one. That's right. Yeah. 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 So you guys built your first one, and then you guys went above and beyond the fold, I think, in, uh, when it comes to simulators by building your own instead of purchasing one. So I think, uh, <laughs> you know, for you guys to kind of work your way into it and then now go into what we call the hardcore sim, I guess you can say, getting into what uh, a Fanatec DD1 steering wheel uh, now you get the real feel of what a simulator is like, and now it's like, why did we not start here? <laughs> right, because it is, um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, we got the Fanatec uh, DD1, so it's a direct drive steering wheel. It's amazing. We uh, use that. We're using that um, extruded aluminum for the frame, which is just rock solid. Yeah, so we, uh, um, my son Mitchell, basically, he's he's the one to put the, all the extruded aluminum together to to get the sim going, and uh, boy, it's uh, it's nice. I really like it. <laughs> it's it's nice when you have a really good setup put together and everything and it all comes together and you know it's interesting because you try to some drivers will tend to put a simulator together together based on their driving style or what they're driving like for me um I put my new sim that I have here at the Audubon together based on you know me driving a formula car so it's basically the lay down setup with a formula steering wheel and everything and then the one back home is made for like a GT car where I have like the actual GT setup where you're sitting up a little bit higher and you're sitting uh, like you would in an actual car and not laying down. So it's interesting when you look at like the different drives, the driving styles and how they set up their simulator, like, and especially too with steering wheels, like Jimmy Johnson, for example, when he was doing the uh, NASCAR stuff last year, he would have an actual NASCAR wheel and then have an actual sit up, like, like he'd have, she have a sit up, uh, sim rig setup and then when he was doing the indycar stuff he had a laid down steering wheel well you know there was one time where he had to do the nascar race and lay down steering wheel with uh an indy open wheel setup basically and you know it was okay for him to it was able enough for him to get by but he struggled a little bit so i feel like you know based on you know what you're going to drive in the sim is kind of how your sim setup's like a little bit which is interesting that you know it applies what in the real world would be like for a setup applies the same in the sim yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. You bring that up. Yeah, we set ours up in you know kind of a GT GT style, and um, so uh, this week, let's talk a little bit about what this week has in store for you, and that is Road Atlanta. Yes, uh, first race of the season for the FR America's 2021 season. It's finally race week, so. Um, <laughs> You know, as we all like to call, we've been counting down the days to uh, this whole weekend and everything. And Road Atlanta, um, I've been able to have the luxury to go there last year and race in the Radical Cup Series last year just to get track experience because we knew Road Atlanta was supposed to be on the counter last year. Unfortunately, it wasn't able to because of COVID. Um, but this year they put it back on as the first race, and we wanted to get some track experience there. 
So we went ahead and finished off the year last year racing the Radicals out there, you know, a series just to go have fun and just, you know, putz around a little bit in the Radical, but just go to get track experience and just familiarize myself with what the track layout's like, look at some of the corners, because Road Atlanta itself, as you can attest to, is a bunch of blind corners and elevation change. You know, going up to turn one, you're hitting a hill and the car just compresses and you're just going straight uphill, and the next thing you know, there's a braking zone that's going uphill, and then there's a corner and apex and then next thing you know you're going downhill into the s's and then once you hit the back straightaway you're going down this long back straightaway to a downhill braking zone through a little left right chicane then up the hill and then you're crescent and then you're coming down the hill into a really fast uh right hander which is basically flat out but it comes up on you quickly because as you come over the bridge and you crest the hill you have no idea where the track is you know you see it going veering off to the right a little bit but after that, you don't know where it's landing, and next thing you know, you might find yourself going straight off the exit curb, and who knows where you're going to end up from there. Yeah, the the track is interesting, particularly that last turn. I guess turn 12, is that turn 12, I think, is what the last one Yeah, because that's 10-11, that you... complex is the chicane, yeah, is 10-11. Um, boy, yeah, because you, when you come over the hill, I mean, it is so blind. There, there is plenty of room to stop. I mean, they did design it with plenty mm-hmm. of room to stop, and you can make some adjustments and everything, so it's not completely blind that you have to do everything, you know, uh, all on your own. However, um, it is... <laughs> uh, the first time you do it has to be very, very intimidating, I think, to just to blindly come over that hill. You know, eventually you're going to be going as fast as you can, but um, it's an interesting uh, place. So you're going to be there with... Uh, I guess it's SVRA weekend. Is yep. That, is that that's the sponsors of the race or organize? Or is it the organizers? Sponsors, I, I guess, guess you could say Tony Perella and his crew put it all together to where it's SVRA. So it's like a vintage car series that happens there. So there's different groups of cars. Then they have the Trans Am series um, that races with them. So you have TA cars and then TA two cars, which they do like an hour and a half race length race. Um, but they're basically like your your stock cars or v i guess you could say a little bit of v8 supercars i guess you could say but they're basically like stock cars um you have like camaros mustangs uh basically chargers and everything but they're made for road courses yeah interesting the 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 track itself is kind of like like a lot of tracks you know they don't put them down in the main in the middle of a uh, neighborhood generally no Uh, they're kind of kind of out 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 a little bit and um so this one's north of uh Buford, Texas, um, northeast of Atlanta. Somewhere um, by Brazelton, right I guess you can say. Brazelton, that's right. That's the name of the town. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, on I-85, I think you get out a couple miles off I-85. So it's a nice place. I mean, even when you're, um, as a spectator, when you're going around, you know, looking at the track, it the elevation changes. It's, I mean, it's crazy. The last I mean, corner. Up and down and up and down. <laughs> the last corner doesn't do its justice. On the track, you feel like... Like, you're at the top of the hill, and you can almost see everything. But then when you get to the bottom of the hill so fast that you barely even feel how much you drop. And then when you look at it from, like, the um, the like from the like from side, I mean, it's a massive drop from that last corner down to, like, the start-finish line. And it's, like, it's so fast that you drop down so quickly that it's, it's basically a blur. You don't even feel it. And it's the same thing, I can – very similar to – Laguna Seca's corkscrew. I mean, you look at that thing and it's very massive and it's just a straight down drop. But when you're in the car, you barely even feel it. So, I mean, unless you're in the car, unless you like do like a track walk with it, that's really when you get to see the true elevation of what the track has in store for you. Because other than that, when you're in the car, it looks massive, but it happens so quickly that you barely even notice it. Yeah, I, I noticed one thing. It seems to be quite a bit of the turns have a lot of gravel uh to absorb i I don't know i haven't been to a ton of tracks but Mm -hmm. um i know that it's it's nice to me where the places where you're possibly kind of kind of come off the track and everything there's a lot of gravel so it does slow you down so it does keep you a you know it'll slow you down before you get to the tire wall i mean i love gravel because i mean that loose of gravel because hey you're not hitting the wall you're not hitting a tire wall and it's keeping your car a little bit safer you might have to get pulled out (laughs) because uh, yeah you know, but uh, I, I did notice that it was kind of, it was a unique track. Uh, again, I haven't seen a ton of tracks, but um, it was a unique track, I think. Yeah, gravel kind of uses itself as like another parachute, I guess you could say. You know, it stops the cars very quickly, but when you're going at high rates of speed, obviously you just can blow right through it, but the tires just sink into the gravel and they stop spinning right there. I know there's a gravel trap, obviously. Um, 
right at the exit of turn one in case someone loses their brakes going into the corner. I think there's one at the top of turn three on the exit on the uh, off the driver's left if you were to go off. Um, same with turn six. Um, turn seven I don't think has any or turn eight and then I know there's a huge gravel trap over at turn nine as soon as you go straight past there and I think there might be one over at 12 um, at the bottom of the hill but I can't be 100% sure I think that might just be all grassy area but yeah gravel and, that, and um, race, racing is a huge component obviously when you're going fast and their tires are heat up you know you get a lot of gravel stuck to the tires um, but some people you know use up if they see rocks they a clever trick that some people will actually use is whenever you're done with a race um some guys will say pick up rubber and come in or like pick up rocks and everything and that's because you really can't touch the car but if your ride height's too low and you pick up rubber and pick up rocks it generally if you pick up enough they'll raise the car up a little bit because the rocks are underneath the tires and the tires are so hot that it picks up all the uh excess rubber and rocks that it'll lift the car up maybe an inch or two so some people will try to use that method to clear some uh, tech inspections to clear ride height rules so it's just some tricks that drivers will use and everything it's just it's the unwritten <laughs> rules of racing i guess you can say to pass the written rule um, and that is interesting because when you do bring a hot tire a car right off the track and you bring it through gravel the amount of gravel that you pick up onto that rubber is it's insane. just incredible it's insane. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's amazing. The first time we did that, uh, we made a mistake going through a brand new tires. They were all nice and hot went right through a gravel thing to, to kind of go to park. And I thought for sure I'd ruin the tires. I mean, cause they were embedded. I mean, they were embedded half inch, mm -hmm. maybe three quarters of an inch into the rubber all over the place. And I thought, well, I either give myself a whole bunch of new grip tire design <laughs> randomly, or this is really, really bad for the tires. Well, and you know, you sometimes will pick up like that excess rubber and everything, especially under yellow flags in a racing condition. Now, when you get under double yellow, you know, obviously you're going slow, the tires are cooling off. Um, but when you're at speed, the tires are very high. And at that time, you're, when you're starting to slow down, you may not be driving in the exact racing line. You might be moving offline to kind of avoid other cars or avoid an incident. And at that time, you could be picking up excess rubber, rocks, or even grass if they go off track and bring grass on the racetrack. Then all of a sudden, your tires collect all that stuff and while they're hot they collect it and next thing you know the tires are cooling off well that stuff is actually getting hard rock hard and solid on your tires and next thing you know when you're coming to a restart you know you have all that excess rubber and excess stuff on your t the uh, debris on your tires you don't get the actual grip that you would like when you were at racing before the yellow flag came out and you want to try to keep your car with the tires the way the yellow flag was when it first came out. So what you do in that situation is you will see cars weaving back and forth trying to clean off all that rubber. And that's what really the main key of weaving the tires back and forth is for, is not just to warm up tires. I mean, yeah, that you can do that through excess braking, especially through going through some high-speed corners very quickly. Yeah, that's a way to heat up the tires. But really, when you see the cars weaving back and forth under a pace lap, that's to clean off the tires to make sure all the excess rubber, and it's a clean sheet of rubber that's on the tire ready to go for a restart. So when you get back going, you have the most maximized amount of grip that you possibly can have. Yeah, another interesting tire thing that I had I had never seen is um, the blistering of the tires, um, and the the blistering of the tires were. Can you? I'm not sure if I kind of explain that, but it it, it kind of took a big chunk out. It, you know, it went very very deep into the tire, and I mm -hmm. had never seen that before. I didn't know. I didn't know what to uh, expect or, or anything like that. And when it was kind of brought to my attention and then they pulled out, uh, they pulled out the chunk of rubber that had blister. I thought it was just pickup. So, well, mm -hmm. first of all, what is rubber pickup for the listeners? I mean, what, is, what, is, what, what, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so rubber pickup is basically access uh, loose rubber that's kind of laid off the track. So when you look in at like a racing line, let's say a very high speed corner, for example, by the apex, there's a clean sheet of track, and that's basically where the r cars are running the whole time. That's where everyone's running one single line. But because we're running so quick in that corner, little bits, pieces of rubber are falling off the tire because we just are using so much rubber. And we have so much load on that tire that it's just shearing off little pieces of, pieces of rubber to get grip in the car. So those little pieces of rubber end up flying off the, car, off the tire and end up on the racetrack, and they end up on the outside groove of the line. So it, you'll see it a lot in oval racing in this case um, because obviously all the rubber lays up next to the wall. 
And then as the tires start to go higher and higher and higher to get more grip, they start to get that excess rubber. And you'll see this a lot in dirt car racing too, is what they call jumping that cushion. And what it is is because you run up as high as you possibly can and where that rubber line is to where you get grip. And if you go over that line, you start to pick up excess rubber that's laying on the track and you're getting that rubber pickup. And what it does is it loosens the car up on you. And next thing you know, the car will just jump out from under you and get loose all of a sudden because where you're seeing that slip angle of the tire of where the traction compound is, is now being absorbed by the rubber and where that clean sheet of rubber that's on the tire is, is now being absorbed by the rubber pickup. And next thing you know, you're losing that traction that, that the tire is having the contact surface with the uh, surface of the track. Wow. Yeah. Um, that it's, it's interesting how, how all of those things, I mean, tire care, uh, tire management, I guess is all, is, is all a big thing that, the, the blistering of, of what I, the blistering that I saw, um, that was really excessive into deep into, um, the tire itself, which of course, you know, you know, could right, head right into uh, fatigue or anything else yeah. you know, with it. So, well, we've, we've always, you and me both have always obviously seen blistering with tires before, you know, both in go-karts, especially, you know, you'll see it quite a bit over in open wheel cars as well, but a lot of it comes with the rough track surface as well. And what rough track surfaces do, um, they just use a lot more of the tire itself. For example, a track like Homestead, it, you won't see a lot of blisters with the tires, but what it does is that it just takes so much rubber away. And what happens is, is that the grip levels just fall off dramatically with the tire, just based on the track surface alone and how grainy it is. So then when you see the tires come in, you know, it's so grainy, it's so rough edged. And next thing you know, you're losing a bunch of grip with the tire and the tires are just shot after that and they lose a lot of life in it. So, you know, you go to some tracks, you can maybe use the tires three sets at maximum life and then you may have to start looking at you know switching tires up to maybe change whereas a home track like homestead you know you maybe use eight laps and they're done the tires are shot and then you got to switch a new set of tires or else you're not going to be able to get that lap again so you know tire management at each track varies on basically the surface of the track itself and it's amazing when you would put a guy who goes eight laps on tires and then stays on that set and then a person who puts a new set of tires some tracks it's very drastic other tracks it's barely a minimum change and it's quite interesting when you go from track to track to see how much tire management how much tire life really means when you put it on a set of car when we put it on a car <laughs> wow um interesting well hey let's uh uh We've, we've talked a lot about tires, a little bit about um, road um, Atlanta this week. Uh, I assume your load-in day is Wednesday, as always, this week? Yeah, my load-in day is going to be Wednesday, and then we'll have a track walk that Wednesday night, and then move into a test session on Thursday, which will then lead us into the weekend on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right. Well, uh, congratulations on the first race of the season, FR Americas. You're racing the F3 uh leger did i say that right leger it's french Le you gotta leger. work on your french a little bit french I, french i gotta work on that i did have french for for lunch today it was quite good <laughs> um so uh okay and um that's a great car and we'll see you at road atlanta you can uh will this be broadcast this year yeah or, so i don't speak? think nobody's really put out a statement or anything like that on when the race is going to be broadcasted there are some rumors or something that I think that's going to be on green light TV. I think it's what it's called. Um, I think SVRA though does live stream the races on their YouTube channel as well. So if you want to look for the race, it's probably going to be live streamed on YouTube with SVRA or through green light TV. It's going to be through one of those areas. But um, if you by chance can't find it, um, go to my uh, social media pages, um, either on my website, you'll be able to find a link there. There's going to be something posted throughout the weekend of when all the practices, all the qualifying and when the races are going to be live streamed. And there'll be links posted throughout my social media throughout the weekend and where you could find the races. So if you just go to my social media, you'll be able to find, uh, all the links you need to find to be able to watch the event. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Google Jordan Missig, M I S S I G Google Jordan Missig, and you can, uh, find all, all the links, Jordan Missig racing.com um youtube channel facebook instagram etc uh race monitor is a tool that you can use you can watch along you can watch mm -hmm. the um the uh, each individual lap uh it's an app that you can uh, download on your phone and you can keep track of all all that and it'll be um you know uh road atlanta i'm sure and svra will be 
um, the uh, since they're the organizers of it. Uh, and then, uh, of course, let's thank, let's thank your sponsors. Yes, of course. Got to thank uh, Audubon Country Club and PSA Check for coming on uh, board with us for this season. Again, um, for prostate cancer and everything, go to psacheck.org to find out more information about PSA Check. Hoping to get them on the uh, podcast here very soon so we can talk more in depth about them and uh, get you people to understand what they're all about and how, why you should get involved with them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, big, big, big opportunity there to get the word out on the importance of uh, getting a, um, I mean, a, a PSA uh, baseline uh, testing. And, you know, you're a great representative uh, ambassador for, for those guys on the racetrack. I think that's fantastic. Perfect. And I'm excited to have him on board and hopefully get him a victory in the first time out. <laughs> Outstanding. Best of luck this weekend, Jordan. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me.